there are a whole number of potential themes, some obviously specific to G20 type issues, others more broadly around, you know, our networks, the new third space, you know, is this the equivalent of Starbucks? It's not your home, it's not your office, but it's somewhere you go where you play out a different set of roles. Um, and, and, and do they therefore have both real <coughs> value, but also some real limitations to them? And how fundamentally can we see a shuffling of power relations in the kinds of networks, uh, particularly those that are spanning the kind of global governance space as, as, as set out in, in what is, as Owen says, this wonderful book on networks of influence. Um, Miles, you're here too. You're a chapter author. So we might pull you in to, to uh, pick up perhaps particularly on Owen's point. But let me first just open up for a round of questions. We probably have got some people online as well who might want to pitch in with some questions, feel free. Um, Kike, you were indicating first. Please give us who you are and where you work and so on. Uh, my name is Enrique Mendizabal. I'm, I'm a researcher here at ODI and uh, I collaborate with Ben a lot on networks. Um, I mean, I, I found this very interesting. I was particularly interested in, in looking at the strategies of developing countries in networks. And I think some of the comments that both Ben and Owen made um, can be addressed by, a, by talking about networks in a little bit more broader way. And I don't want to get bogged down in the definition of networks. But there are a number of assumptions that are, that are made when we talk about them. One is that they're not hierarchical. And in fact, they are. And as Ben and Owen both said, you know, there is a, relation, a power relationship between some members of the network. And we know this from Facebook. The more friends you have, the more friends you're going to get. I mean, it's <laughs> unless somebody intervenes with specific rules, you're always going to have that. Uh, the more uh, clients you have, the more clients you're going to get in the market. Uh, and uh, another point is that there's a suggestion that there are no rules. But in fact, there are lots of rules. Um, and we're talking about global networks like these. The, is the rules of international relations that apply and, of course, the rules of force. But if you look at very informal networks in countries, social networks among individuals of a particular social group or political group or economic background, the rules are very clear. They might not be written down, but they're very clear for those who participate. And there's a huge cost of exit, because if you break those rules and you leave that group, then you are losing out significantly. Entering that group is also expensive, and I think um, Ben's point about why do you let them in? Uh, you let them in because you want something out of them, because if they come in and knock on the door, you will charge for that entrance. And in the case of the G7, G20, it's quite clear what are the, the costs of entry. You have to prove that you have enough means or enough power to participate. So there is a cost. Although it's not a clear fee, there is a cost of entry. And there is a huge um, cost of maintenance. Um, once you're in the network, maintaining the network is extremely expensive. And I, um, I made a comment uh, to Alison's podcast or Owen's paper about that. I think that the idea of networks or a networking system for international aid is fantastic, but let's not forget that it does require a facilitation system or process to exist. So um, all these user-driven um, or generated websites, there's an assumption that the user is in charge and there's nothing else to it. There's no cost. In fact, there's been millions of pounds invested into creating the environment that would allow you to participate in it. And the same thing goes with the G20. I mean, the G20, yes, there is no secretariat, but, but the countries that are leading the way and are running the process are investing millions of pounds to run it, to organize the events, to, to allow countries to visit, to keep the media interested, to maintain the momentum. And those are other costs that I think we need to take into account, which would be very relevant to how you get developing countries, uh, especially the poorest ones, to, to participate in this. And of course, there's the issue of enforcement, and I think that... Again, at the global level, it's difficult because the only enforcement is the use of force. Um, but when you, when you go down a little bit to, uh, to, to the country level, maybe the regional level, there are ways of, of enforcing some of the agreements that uh, these forums, these groups arrived at. Um, and and I, can, I, I, think, I think we can all come up with examples of our own personal lives. But you can, you can look at that in terms of, of how certain countries and certain forums will, will sort of punish a... Uh, a, a member or a non-member who doesn't abide by the rules. And these rules exist, they're just maybe not, not written out. So I think if we look at networks this way and we kind of break down, uh, or we look at the assumptions of, of networks and we, and we question them a bit, we might end up uh, coming up with more practical solutions about how do you get these non-members or these weaker members to actually take advantage or, or benefit from participating in these, in these spaces. Okay, very good, thank you. 
Martin, please. Uh, Piers Harden, I'm in the private sector. Uh, I'd like to know how, how do these networks die? I mean, if you look at the G7, it dragged on and on. They uh, enlarged itself by inviting people they wanted to invite in. Um, the final agenda was made before you even appeared. Uh, they got the press to build things up and then produced nothing. Um, they sort of, uh, it was a photo op for leaders. And finally, it became a forum for, a, a forum for tourism promotion. Mm -hmm. And I just, and, and you know, every network I look at, the Commission for Africa had a political end. Everything is done, as seems to me, uh, suddenly some politician somewhere says, my God, we've missed this problem. Let, let's, have a, let's have a network. Let, let's set up Commission for Africa and hopefully everyone will say what a grand job we did. And, and nothing really comes out of them. So I want to know how do they die or are we going to end up like Facebook? You know, well, I don't know. I've never been on it. But are we going to end up where, you know, you just have hundreds of friends and very little gets done? Mm. Okay, very good. Thank you, uh, Sheila Page, ODI. Uh, a couple of questions really following on from that. I mean, to me, the, my impression is the G20 and most networks are most sort of psychologically important, if you like, for their weakest members. I mean, the US doesn't gain anything by me being a member of the G20. The Netherlands and Spain were desperate to get in. So given that hierarchy, there is a, a sort of a reinforcing the power relationships. I mean, you not only want to be in because you're weak, but you're weakened because your demand for being in it is greater than their demand for having you there. Uh, secondly, is it important to distinguish between networks that cross borders and therefore have a function? I mean, Russia in the G8 was interesting because Russia wasn't in all the other in, uh, international organizations. China is only just getting into them. So it's a place where you can talk to people who are not in them, as opposed to networks within existing organizations mm -hmm which have more the, the property of cliques or elites. I mean, the cabinet, after all, was a subsection of the Privy Council, which was a subsection of the Grand Council. I mean, the uh, networks do tend to form and become formal, and then I suppose the original organization should disappear. And just a, a, a final uh, question on the, um, uh, have you looked at something like the OECD, mm -hmm. which after all was a network and is now in a sense, it's still a network. It has no, it has an institution, so it violates your definition, but it doesn't have power. It doesn't have any implementing uh, status. It remains an institutionalized network. I mean, I really don't think that your distinction is, is very clear. Okay, very good. Um, I think we should take a round, but Miles, there are a couple of things said <laughs> on uh, Commission for Africa related issues. I think. Would that be okay if Mars has a chance to speak specifically on that? Um, just let me make a couple of comments, if I may. One on, on the general point. I mean, I do sh share the share the point in the, 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 the in the brief um, about the risk of the emergence of the G20 serving actually further to marginalise uh, the poorest countries. I think there is a real risk that you know, if you have uh, the G7 or G8, which ostensibly represents the interests of one billion people and leaves the other five billion people outside it. If you shift, uh, if you shift that to, to uh, an organization or network that ostensibly uh, represents five billion people, then I think the risks of the remaining billion being left outside that um, are even greater. So I, I think I agree with that. Um, on the Commission for Africa specifically, I think um, I think it was set up, uh, you know, in some ways because there was there was a bit of a sense that the existing mechanisms weren't working as effectively as they as as, the, as they could have done, which is one of the characteristics I think of a, of a network that Leonardo mentioned. I think that um, you know there was this uh, big momentum after the um, Kananaskis and Evian uh, summits, the G8 summits, and there was a bit of a sense that that was that momentum was was dying away, and that the the mechanisms that were in place uh, weren't working as well as, as they should. For example, this, this uh, grouping of, of Africa personal representatives, which were supposed to be people very close to presidents and prime ministers, gradually moved further and further down the hierarchy. They became lower level officials, and that, that wasn't working as well. So, um, so the Commission for Africa you know, was, was set up as a way of, of, of regenerating some of that momentum, and, and undoubtedly in the process, caused some resentment amongst those who were part of the official 
mechanisms. The, there's no doubt there was that risk and that the Germans and the Japanese in particular got very ticked off indeed with the establishment of the, uh, uh, of the Commission for Africa. Um, I think that it was a pretty, you know, you will not be surprised to know that I think it was pretty effective in, in doing the job because it was a network that was set up for a very specific purpose and for a very specific period of time. So the answer to the question is how do networks die is that they commit suicide at the end of their process when their job has been done. Although what's really interesting is that I've continued to remain in touch with most of the people who were on the commission and the Africa commissioners, those from Africa, are now really interested <coughs> in using next year, 2010, to look back at the way in which the recommendations that came out of that whole process in 2004 or 2005 have been implemented and carried forward and having some sort of further, uh, if not report, at least some sort of uh, um, gathering of the, of the Commission for Africa again to reflect on that progress and, and make their own um, uh, recommendations about what needs to happen in order to be able to deliver on those promises. Of course, working very closely with the other organizations uh, that have been set up, like the Africa Progress Panel, to, uh, to, uh, to take it forward. One other thing, I mean, I think that, um, you, you know, I in answer to the question of, you know, did it really make a difference? I, I believe it did make a difference uh, to, to helping to set that agenda of putting issues like infrastructure, uh, agriculture, higher and further education back on the agenda because they had undoubtedly uh, fallen off the, um, the agenda. Uh, and I think the final thing to say is that it, it certainly changed the perception of some of the key members uh, on the Commission for Africa and the people in their governments. There was certainly a, a, a feeling, I think, at the beginning of the Commission for Africa certainly amongst people like, like Geldof, but also, I think, Blair, that, um, you know, Africa was a scar on the conscience of the world. We needed to do something about it because it was the right thing to do and that Africa was failing. Undoubtedly, by the end of that 18-month period, there was a much stronger sense that actually things in Africa are really beginning to work. Uh, it's beginning to develop its own uh, momentum and that the G8 uh, and the international community's job was not to kind of support this failing continent but to get behind its emerging success. Thank you. Very good, Miles. Thank you very much. Um, do you want to take the microphone? I mean, in many ways, the, the networks have been with us for a very long time, but I think the study of networks perhaps is a slightly younger craft, and I think perhaps some of the debate here reflects the fact that we don't actually have that many scholarly works like this to really focus our attention on what really networks are achieving or not. Um, Nairi, Leo, how would you like to handle some of those comments? Of um, sure. I think... Uh, the, the points on, uh, referring to the definition of a network are, are useful. When we started uh, to work on this, we also struggled a lot with uh, finding a good definition of a network because the, the concept can get very fuzzy around the edges and you start asking yourself, oh, is this a network, is that a network? And we thought that the most useful way to think about it is to just focus on two properties that these things must have. The first is that there have to be repeated interactions among the same actors. That's why networks are different from markets. In a market, you know, two people might come together, transact once, but never again. Whereas in a network, it's important that the same actors are the ones interacting over and over again. And the second thing, which goes to the issue of hierarchy, is that nobody in the network has the authority to arbitrate the dispute among the members. So, if, you know, two countries or two members, uh, you know, get into a conflict over something, uh, you just can't resolve it. Nobody has the authority to arbitrate it and, and settle it whereas in institutions you do. If at the IMF you have, uh, into countries have a dispute on a, on a report, uh, you know, you can vote on it. And, and, uh, and there's a process through which uh, that dispute will be settled one way or another. And that's what uh, makes, uh, makes different. Now, just because networks are not hierarchical in this sense does not mean that they are not sites for power asymmetry. Of course they are, that's the heart of the book. Uh, and the issue of hubs then becomes important. Because in a network, power doesn't come from levels in a hierarchy or steps. It comes from hubs. And if you were to plot on a map you know, a, a network, uh, whether it's a telephone network or a financial network uh, or any other kind of network, you would find that those areas in which the connections are most concentrated uh, are more important, of course, than those points on the network at which you have very few. The friends uh, in friends terminology or the city of London and Wall Street uh, make the same argument. And therefore, those people who control those connections in those hubs will have greater capacity to control that network. Um, the issue of resources is very important, too. Cost, uh, the costs matter. Uh, networks are a lot cheaper than formal institutions, 
but that doesn't mean the cost is zero. We're not, we're not saying that. Uh, what we are saying, though, is that who puts in the money uh, makes a big difference. Uh, the G20, in some ways, is sort of the, the writ of networks. The price uh, for a room is very expensive, and there's only presidential suites. Uh, but there's many other networks that we deal with uh, in the book, which are networks of developing countries. Uh, in the case of the, uh, the um, budget officials network that Nairi mentioned, you're dealing with uh, a lot of sub-Saharan African countries, many of which cannot afford to pay their own way into the network, and you need somebody to pick up the tab. And there, it's very important, the relationship between the person or the country or the government that's bankrolling the network and the rest of the members. Uh, this is a tension that we see over and over again, especially in networks that bring together donor countries and recipients of aid. Uh, in that network, in order for things to work, uh, you need to have a certain distance. Uh, the donors have to be able to provide the funding and the resources for the network without trying to capture it and then use that money to you know, get the network to do their bidding. Uh, this tension comes up very clearly in the HIPIC network, the finance ministers of, of highly indebted poor countries who wanted to you know, learn from each other and to coordinate positions on the debt relief and the, uh, the, um, the debt relief uh, debate. And there you see very clearly how at different points, the donors want to be in the room, they want to you know, have strong positions, they want to use their leverage to you know, capture that network. Uh, and over and over again, you see the leadership of the network uh, pushing back. And at some point, an equilibrium is reached. Hopefully, uh, the good scenario is one in which there's a, an equilibrium with the donors providing the funding and then stepping back, allowing those to uh, others in the network to, to do their thing. Uh, why would they do this, uh, the donors, that is? Well, oftentimes, they may find it's not worth it. In other cases, they may find that it is worth it because it is in some ways uh, serving some interest of theirs. For example, South Africa plays a very important role bankrolling the Sub-Saharan African um, Budget Officials Network in our, in our book. And you, are, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, it's the uh, South Africa, sorry, the Treasury there is providing a lot of the manpower, the brains, the money. Uh, and why would they continue to do this? Well, partly because it enhances their, you know, their regional profile. It, uh, you know, increases, uh, you know, stability in other countries. Perhaps uh, they have certain interests that that are served by it, and therefore this is a kind of good equilibrium that you find. In other cases, you find that the resource providers would really try to capture the network, and in that case. Uh, those who, the weaker members of the network, can either walk out uh, if they can, or they'll just have to sort of uh, deal with it. And that's sort of the bad equilibrium, and there's a couple of examples uh, here. Um, one point on the uh, importance of the links between networks and international organizations or formal institutions, and this is really, really important. Because at the end of the day, we've been discussing a lot of uh, a lot the power dynamics inside networks. You know, who has the strongest voice, the loudest voice, whose positions prevail within the network. But then, you, once you settle that game, that power game within a network, the question becomes: Will that network be able to use formal institutions to um, to implement its uh, its ideas, its proposals? Because networks, after all, they just cannot do this. They just don't have, by definition, uh, the kinds of arms and tools to to implement. Uh, and this is where the G20, to go back to, to the initial example, will become very important. Uh, you, all it is is a communique that appears in the cover of the Financial Times. Uh, that's it. There's no laws, there's no uh, prescriptions, no regulations, no implementation guidelines. What happens then really is the most mysterious and interesting part of the G20. In a series of orders are then, presumably, are then transmitted from presidents to ministers, each one, of, of course, interpreting different parts of the communique as they see fit. Uh, perhaps ignoring some, perhaps focusing on others. Then those ministers pass on, you know, orders to deputies. Those deputies pass on orders to executive directors in the World Bank, the IMF, wherever. Uh, and along the chain, uh, something happens. At each step, you have a different interpretation of what the communique, what the G20 is supposed to be doing. Uh, and therefore, if G developing countries want to retain uh, some degree of influence, they should sure, try to do their best uh, to engage the network, to lobby their regional representative, if you like, in the G20. They should do these uh, alternative parallel uh, capacity building networks. But they should never forget that the most important battles politically are going to be fought in the formal institutions, in the boards of the bank and the fund, in the UN, in, in different places where decisions actually happen and where developing countries have uh, more room to maneuver, to use the rules, to, to uh, do certain things. Uh, and finally, one point on discursive power. Uh, in a network, 
because there's a, a forum for discussion, there's more power to those who prepare, to those who are able to put on the table uh, a better idea. Even the, I've been to a few G20 deputies, deputies meetings, and I can tell you that those who have a greater command of the English language have a considerable advantage because they're able to deliver points, even if they're from countries that are not materially much more powerful, uh, they are able to sway perspectives and language at that point, because all of this really is about discursive power, right? In the end, communicates and so on, and symbols. Uh, those who are able to deliver messages and capture things uh, have an advantage, and this is a, perhaps a, a, a subtle point, but it's one that's quite important to the weaker countries in the networks. Thank you. Thank you. Nairi. Yeah, there, there, were, there were four points that, for me, came out of the questions that I thought it might be worth answering, too. Alison, you said, what's the catalyst for, for, for networks emerging? And I do think it is failures of institutions. I mean, it, for these intergovernmental networks to emerge, it's failures, I guess, in terms of voice and representation and responsiveness and speed. And we've seen that very much in the G20, as in other networks that, that we looked at. Um, Piers asked, how do networks die? And my answer to that would be slightly different from Miles. I don't think they do pack up their, their, their offices. I think what happens in a network, which is interesting and is a positive thing about networks, is that they sort of die quite gracefully. They, people, because attendance is not mandatory and um, because there are no formal rules of attendance, then when networks stop being useful or interesting for, for members, they can simply start sending more and more junior people until they're not sending anyone at all or promising to connect by telephone, but they're not connecting. So, so they have this kind of graceful death mechanism. Um, and, um, and likewise, when the opposite happens, as, they, as is happening with the G20 leaders, when they become more um, powerful, then Alison's question about accountability kicks in. Because when once networks start trying to use authority, you know, Owen's point about um, their power does kick in because members become more and more reluctant, um, particularly less powerful members, to permit authority to be used outside of a forum in which they have a protected voice. So that's where you see the relationship with international organizations really kicking in. Um, both um, Ben and Owen raised the issue of are they just symbolic? Is there no real power in networks? And certainly we're not arguing that they, um, they tip power relations in the world you know, upside down. But on the, I think what comes out from our studies to me that's interesting is that there are these three things that networks do if structured in a certain way. The first is information. It's about information sharing and the acquisition of information. The second is it gives the members of a network an opportunity really to clarify and formulate their preferences and strategies. And third, it really does give members of a network a chance to coordinate positions. I think the far more instructive example than the G8 is the G7 finance network, the finance deputies and finance ministers, because there you see those three things really in operation, where the G7 finance deputies really do speak to one another regularly, and they have the IMF brief them on the issues. So they're able to tap into the power of the IMF to get their own briefing from the organization, that gives them information. It gives them a chance to formulate their own positions and coordinate them, and then feed them back both through other informal organizations and through formal ones. And it's that that we notice that a couple of the networks we look at in the book succeed in, the HIPAC finance ministers, the four African presidents, the East Asian finance networks succeed in that. And indeed, in the East Asian finance networks, they succeed in being a catalyst for formal organizations. And then finally, Sheila made the excellent point about the psychological impact of networks, and I think that's an important one. In our first meeting about this project, um, I still remember a, um, one of our Latin American participants um, in his comments on the G20 finance network saying, the G20 finance ministers group formed after the East Asian crisis was just the perfect co-option technique of the United States. If the G20 had not been formed immediately, the borrowers of the, the IMF, the powerful emerging economies, would have rebelled, 
would have walked away much sooner from the fund and would have forced a much more radical reform in the fund. But by forming the G20 Finance Ministers Group, they headed off that opposition. They created a group and a participation which made it difficult for emerging countries who were participating in the network to rebel. And that's a sort of, I think that's part of the sort of psychological impact that, that Sheila's pointing out to us. Another aspect of that impact that we're noticing with the G20 leaders is the extent to which those that are in the group can use their group membership to leverage their power within their regions. And that's making developing countries in certain regions very nervous. That, that their G20 members, they don't see as representing their interests, but rather as consolidating their regional hegemony. And, and that, again, poses some real issues. So those are issues that are important for us to consider. Um, but I think that the, the positive message lies in the way in which a network structured with a counterbalancing network and among developing countries can be this forum for information sharing, for preference and strategy forming, and for coordination. And that those three elements, they're certainly not enough to change global politics, but they are terribly important to maximize the small room for maneuver that those developing countries actually have in both formal and informal institutions. Thanks. Great, very good. Are there any other last questions? I want to do another quick round for Dirk and I then... I might want to jump in. Yeah, I'll bring them both back in. Uh, Dirk, Dirk Tefelder, ODI. Um, I have a question about sort of the, the D20 um, network and really to think about uh, the interest of developing countries and the poorer countries in, in the D20, D20 network. Um, the question to the panel is, is what is uh, for you uh, a definition of success for developing countries in this, in this network? So um, it could be that it actually is in the best interest for developing countries that the G20 ha have their own house in order so that they make sure that they uh, do not become more protectionist that they uh, regulate their own markets properly, um, and uh, a, a number of, of these other issues. Yeah. And then, of course, a second, secondary uh, objective could then be to, to think about um, how to turn it into a development agency and to provide more funds and so on. Um, but, and and with, with respect to that point, I think that um, sort of IMF lending to uh, low-income countries has tripled. Um, uh, in, in a year, whether it's been due to the D20, I mean, I think you can discuss that, but at least it has come from one billion uh, in a year to four billion in a year, and it's likely to increase even further. So it, it yes, has a very tiny share compared to uh, overall, uh, so the tiny share is going to African countries and low-income countries, but um, there has at least been some response. Um, equally, maybe the World Bank has, been, has responded a bit less quickly, um, and uh, but, uh, but, but also there, there has been at least uh, at least uh, uh, some response. Now, um, the question then becomes, what is in the interest and, uh, and, and for poor countries? Um, and I, here I think you also need to reflect between, uh, uh, in terms of differences between what happened uh, at different D20 leaders' meetings. Um, is it so that each le uh, meeting has been a disaster, <laughs> uh, as you say it, or could it be that some have been more successful than others? And, uh, and I think that, personally, I think that, uh, that the London summit was much more successful in raising development issues than, uh, than the Pittsburgh meeting, where uh, discussions were about global imbalances, which is more like a, a G2, or perhaps even a G1 uh, discussion. Um, so the, the discussion that uh, the London summit were mentioned developed much more, and, I, and it's my impression that at least some of it has been followed up, less protectionism, uh, more IMF lending uh, and resources to, to poorer countries. So I, I, I do think that at least some has, has been followed up. And um, a coordination of fiscal stimuli, to think about um, uh, fiscal stimuli that, that has, has at least cushioned the impact in developed countries, which has also had uh, a useful impact on developing countries. So at least some success, I think, can be claimed. Great, thanks, Doug. Just over there. And then, Owen, I don't know if you're going to have a point that you want to come in on in a moment. No, okay. Uh, Donald Curtis. <laughs> formerly of Birmingham. Um, this uh, interesting discussion has, it seems to me, has one um, word missing, which is often used in, in, in this discourse, and that is club or collectivity. 
Um, I know there's different ways in which this triumvirate is, is, is lined up. But um, it, it, only in your second round of talks do you start talking about groups. And I'm just wondering to what extent, uh, or w whether it's significant when a network turns itself into a group. A group being significant because it's got an external boundary and things happen on the outside of it. Um, and um, it is quite interesting that the, the demand for the G20 arises out of a crisis. A crisis in this sense is a hierarchy has failed to manage the common good. Um, and um, the, there is a, a new collective interest, and, there's another, and, and then there's some sort of a struggle to find representation of the collective interest. But uh, where is this boundary with the group? Okay, very good. Ben, you had one reflection yourself before I pass over to Mary and the last word. Um, just a couple of things. First of all, it's clear from the discussion here that networks are in the eyes of the beholder. <laughs> Um, and if I go back after this meeting to speak to some of my colleagues who work in transnational advocacy networks, say we've been talking about the G20 as a network, they would laugh at me. Um, that, that's the first point. The other point is that there's a sense in which this debate, I think, echoes the evidence-based policy debate. Um, maybe 15, 20 years ago, people thought about evidence-based policy as you develop the research and in a linear way it informs policy. Um, and over time, we started to realise that relationships mattered and political context mattered. And actually, the most important thing for evidence to inform policy was political context. Similarly, in the networks literature, particularly in the aid system, we started off looking at how networks were being formed, the kinds of issues that were being addressed. We might have started to move on to look at the relationships that were being uh, created. And I think the real benefit of this book is it puts the political context front and centre and says you may have all these different <coughs> mechanisms. The political context is what determines the value or otherwise of a network. And I think that particularly this, uh, this move beyond a functionalist approach to explicitly considering power and politics is, I think, the most important contribution of this book from my, my own view. Very good. Leo, any last reflections on those? And then Nairi. Um, sure, just uh, reacting, I think, to, to that very last point, I think our, one of our central points uh, here today is that the G20 is not this sort of mystical, you know, special entity in world politics. It's a network. Uh, and by that, I don't mean, it's interesting that politically it's, it's become, you know, network is, you know, do-gooders, you know, you know in maybe on the left, as opposed to sort of large, powerful governments. They're all networks in the sense that uh, they are all, um, they, fit a they fit a certain definition and they all... Uh, I think obey similar dynamics. You know, this, this, these three notions that we put on the table, uh, resources, co cost of entry and exit, and relationship to formal institutions, I think you could argue they apply to all networks. And, uh, and perhaps we can learn a lot about different kinds of networks by applying those ideas. If you notice in the book, we have all sorts of networks from uh, very powerful governments to very weak governments. And finally, I would say, uh, in terms of success, Derek's question. Uh, I think I agree, certainly, that it's important for the big players to get uh, things right. If they do that themselves, uh, a lot of the problems will be, uh, if not solved, at least uh, very much advanced. Uh, but the second point is really to get, to make sure that uh, developing countries can still get some key elements uh, on the agenda. And that might mean uh, using civil society in the developed countries to lobby their own governments to put those issues on the agenda or to use, uh, to lobby, you know, regional players like Indonesia uh, or South Africa uh, by other countries, neighboring countries, to help them put their issues on the agenda. Otherwise, they may drop out of the, of the top agenda, and that's a significant concern. Um, and, uh, and finally, perhaps networks could help expedite the reform of formal institutions. Uh, in the Zedillo report that uh, uh, I was, uh, helped worked on, uh, the the report very much is addressed to the G20 and the leaders of, uh, of the G20, among others. And the reason is because networks perhaps might accelerate, might catalyze uh, the reform of formal institutions in a way that those institutions themselves will not be able to. Uh, and perhaps uh, if that works out, then we could argue that that's a significant uh, uh, positive impact. Um, no, I think it's all been said. I mean, I, I, I agree with uh, Dirk's reactions. Um, that if we step back and ask a different question, which is, has the coordination undertaken under the umbrella of the G20 leaders been good for all countries in the global economy? Yes, I think I, I would agree with you that the coordination and speed of response has been cru crucial. And even taking one step back, I, I, 
I think that one of the things that I've said a couple of times already that, that comes through in our studies is that it's very good for there to be counterbalancing powers in any network. And the G20 spells a new, a, a new and different balance of power which is more likely to leave space, not just for weaker members within the G20, but perhaps for those outside as well. So I think in, in, in those senses, um, I would agree with you. Very good indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Um, maybe, I mean, we're living in a networked uh, universe. There seems to be no question about that, whether it's in our personal lives or in our work lives or in the intergovernmental space, networks are with us. But I think one of the messages I got around, out of the discussion today that um, irrespective of their potential influence, we're not yet in a world where networks trump organizations and perhaps a world in which organizations think more like networks is, is, is one of the ways forward. I want to thank Nairi, Leonardo, Owen and Ben very much for a very stimulating uh, discussion today. And I would urge all of you to take a look at what is a terrific book. And for those of you who do want a copy, please see Nairi, Nairi and Leo. They somewhere have a bag or a box uh, of 10, 10 of these left over, which you can purchase here. Thank you very much for coming. We hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.